it's nice to see those of you I can see. It's nice to hear from those of you I can hear from. Thank you so much for making time and allowing us to come into your space virtually, be it your bedroom, your living room. Thank you so much. Um, we do not take it for granted. Um, now today marks our second day and our final day of our virtual town hall. Um, the theme for this virtual town hall was COVID and education, COVID-19 and education and its impacts, the impacts it has on basic education and we were able to extensively cover impacts of COVID-19 in basic education and today we look at what it has done and what it continues to do in institutions of higher learning. And I'm privileged to know most of you who've tuned in today and I know you're, you've been impacted and you've been affected in one way or the other and I'm really excited to hear what you guys have to say. I'm sure we'll have more members joining in as time goes on but because of um, time I just want us to begin now and I'll begin by giving a recap of what we did yesterday for those of you who are not able to join us. Um, as I said earlier, we were talking about um, basic education, basic education running from pre-unit all the way to high school. We summed that up to basic education. And um, our two speakers, Aisha Ibrahim, she'll be joining us later. She's a sexual and reproductive health and a sign language interpreter. And we also had Madam Angela Ndaka. She's having a bit of trouble signing and logging in, but I hope she'll be able to soon. Bill, but I hope you're taking care of that. Um, she's a PhD researcher at University of at Otago in New Zealand. And um, these two speakers were very instrumental in guiding the discussion yesterday. Um, and from, if I can just um, give you a brief, from our discussion yesterday, we were able to identify well, I'll just compile them into four main impacts COVID-19 has had on basic education. And number one was definitely, um, Madam Daka was talking about 40% of our GDP comes from um, everything. Basically, our economy will be disrupted as a country and as a continent. And number two possible impact would be widening of the poverty, already existing poverty gap between the rich and the poor. And number three, we talked about, um, we'll have, and we've seen this, we'll have an increase in cases of violence, uh, child trafficking, negligence, and teenage pregnancies. And these numbers are worrying. And number four, we we're looking at illiteracy levels. Even with um, the implementation of free primary education, we already had a tremendous amount um, of uh, illiteracy in Kenya. And now we are, we, are, we are asking ourselves, what happens when there's completely zero education going on? What will happen to our literacy levels? And then from the discussion, um, it was very um, you know, interactive and we came up with an, an array of solutions and I'll just quickly brush through, but we'll do a complete document after our conference today and, and uh, just send on, share on our different social media platforms. So we are talking about a complete technological shift um, in the case that if this ever happens again, can we have implemented the laptop project, for example? And which brings me to my second solution, which you guys suggested. Um, we need to think co-designing. We need to think stakeholder engagement. We need to think public participation in designing and implementing our policies. In that, if you're talking about the laptop project, we need to bring in the Ministry of um, um, Electricity, Water, and all that to ensure the electricity penetration rates in Kenya, um, you know, are good so that we are able to, you know, actually uh, use this technology. So, yes, I'm talking about complete technological shift as a country and as a continent. We are talking about co-designing um, our policies and the, the implementation part. When we are talking about teenage pregnancies, and this was a very controversial topic we touched a bit on the health bill the proposed health health bill by kiheka we talked about the already existing policy documents that have not been implemented and we're asking uh why is it why is the process so slow the implementation process so slow and um aisha was very you know vocal about it and she was saying let us as kenyans stop acting like this is something new um, let us stop acting like we are shocked. This is something that has been happening. It is only that the COVID-19 pandemic is amplifying what is already in the ground. And we are saying, 
uh, we need to look at teenage pregnancies from a, a whole, uh, from a wider perspective rather, in that it is a systemic problem. There's a, there's a break, there's a, our system is broken because we are raising our children in unsafe um, homesteads with dangerous parents and dangerous guidance guardians we are raising them around unsafe neighborhoods and in case anything happens to them we report to unsafe police stations with an unsafe and um you know a biased judi judicial system so if we are able to actually mend our systems only then can we have a um, a complete and workable solution to teenage pregnancies and everything and we are able to share with you guys the helplines in as much as you can't completely as an individual change the system there are little things you can do there's um every every individual has a role to play and if you know someone who's been violated we are able to share with you guys these helplines and we'll also do that we'll keep doing that on our social media platforms and on our, our different groups and um paul was also very keen to um talk about data like as a government do we have current and accurate data on what exactly is going or is going on in our society um, we also talked about depoliticizing our policies and our laws so that if a matter like teenage pregnancy does not become a political, um, a political manifesto for an individual just to get a particular seat. And my take home as an individual was youth as people, our generation, we are a product of a broken system and hence we are the best uh, we offer the best solutions because we know where the shoe pinches most. So I don't know if I've done justice, but I believe I, I tried compiling all the notes I had. There's so much more and we'll keep sharing. After all this, we'll have a, a sit down with our team, Youth in Policy, and come up with a simplified policy brief and share with you guys. Now, before we start today's conversation, I can see a lot of people are joining. Um, yes, we are actually a good number and more will keep coming. Just keep inviting your friends. This is a very important conversation we're about to have. Um, yes, before um, I, I take you through what we are supposed to talk about today, let me just give you a few netiquette um, issues or directives, yeah? If you have a comment or you want to contribute to the conversation, and as I keep on saying, there's a reason why we call this a town hall and not a webinar, because we want contributions and we want people to give their views. Um, just post on the wall. Is it the right? Yeah, on your right side, there's an option for you to post your comments. We'll be able to see, you can post it to everyone. Or if you want to make a contribution, just post it there, I'll be able to see and point you out. Now, if you want to speak, I would kindly ask you to um, let us see who is speaking, if it is possible. If it is not possible, well, it's okay. We can, we can just work with the voice. Um, if there's, you also want to contribute and you don't want to write anything, just raise your hand, not literally from your house. There's an option for you to raise your hand and then I'll see what you want to say. Uh, we'll give you a chance. Lastly, um, we are talking about institutions of higher learning. I've been in uni. I have vied for political positions. I know how us guys can get. This is not a political forum. If you want to gain votes, we can arrange something for you afterwards. Um, we'll have a few student leaders coming in. I hope they'll be able to get this. Um, let us not politicize everything. I hope that is clear. And um, views expressed here do not represent any institution, any institution of higher learning or, or an organization you're working for. This is a safe space. Give us your experiences during COVID-19. Uh, we are not attaching you to the institution you're coming from, right? I hope that is in order and I hope I've made everything clear. All right, I feel like I'm taking up um, time for our speakers, but today we talk about COVID-19 and, and the impacts it has had on institutions of higher learning. And we are looking at, yes, Madam Daka, thank you for joining, you're not late. I was just giving a recap of what we did yesterday and you, you're one of the speakers, so Karibu Sana. Thank you for always making time. I know it's late in New Zealand. Thank you for staying up. Now, um, when we are talking about effects COVID-19 has had on higher learning, we're not just uh, looking at it from 
um, an individual perspective. Of course, our students have been affected, but what does that what does this mean for our country? Because it it um, interferes with a population that is supposed to, you know, um, contribute to the workforce. Now, what does that mean for our economy? What does that mean for our country? When you're talking about um, administering online classes, if they're actually being administered, and I would really love to hear from you guys, um, do we uh, are they are we are we doing it um, from a you know an empirical point of view? Um, we are looking at the quality of education during this pandemic. If you're if you're talking about research, are students able to uh, you know conduct research and come up with research papers and all these things we do physically? Is that being is that being made possible? And we are privileged to have a lecturer. She will give her point of view on how she's been able to administering um, classes online and what the experience has been for her. Before I water down what they're about to say, let me just introduce our panel who will take us through uh, this very important topic. Um, number one, we have um, Anne Kaluvu, the ever beautiful. Um, she is a JQuart lecturer. She, yeah, Jomo Kenyatta. I, 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 there's just something that comes with after saying Jomo Kenyatta International. It just feels like saying international. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Jomo Kenyatta. University, University yeah. yes, of technology, agriculture and technology. Agriculture. Yeah. yeah, she lectures IT. She is a PhD fellow. She holds a master of science in computer science. She holds a bachelor um, of business information, te information technology with a first class, you guys. Um, she is interested, I just had to say, she is interested in software engineering, information systems, and she's also a champion for young people across this, across East Africa. And she's a strong believer in sustainable development. May I also add, she's a mother. This is a full-time job and people don't, don't, don't recognize that. Yeah, she's a mother. She has a very addictive laughter. And I'll just end it at that. Thank you so much for making time. I'm really looking forward to you know, hearing what you have to say. And we also have Paul. Yes, Paul, I can see you. Um, Paul is a Moy University graduate. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Human Resource Management, and he currently works as a program assistant in learning interventions at PAL, PAL Network. PAL means People Action for Learning Networks. This is an NGO that deals with education assessment, research, advocacy, interventions in learning um, with the aim of improving learning outcomes. So you will be telling us if um, we are doing justice to education system through online learning. Yes, and he's also tall, dark and handsome. It's a pleasure having you. Um, yes, um, I think I'll just start with you, Paul. Uh, before we, we, we get to the questions and everything, we live in uncertain times and it's just good to check up on people. How have you been coping amidst COVID-19? How has it affected you at an individual level? How are you keeping your sanity check um, in check? Uh, as you also give your opening remarks. Thank you, thank you, Miriam. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, uh, it's been interesting. The first, uh, the first few days, uh, I think we closed office a week after the first case. Uh, we are an international NGO, so they are they're very serious about the whole thing. So we closed office the next week, the following week. Um, the first few weeks were not easy. Working from home wasn't easy, but then you get used to it uh, after some time, and, and it becomes it becomes a culture. Now, now I don't even want to go to the office; I just want to work from home. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I think for for just keeping sanity, um, I like I like meditating and taking walks. They're, they're very important, and of course, working out uh, plays a big role as well. Um, yes, so on my on my opening remarks, I think uh, the conversation we're having today is very, is very important because uh, the old saying that education is the backbone of a society never goes old. It, it, it is and, it's, and it still is. Uh, so uh, so it's, it, will, it will be interesting to just interact with everyone to hear what, what, what they think, uh, you know, the impact has been and then we also share from our perspective, we did, uh, we did some surveys to just check on. We did a survey in Turkana and Tanadelta 
to see what's happening on the ground and then uh, and, you know just to so that we can have interventions that are very cohesive with the needs on the ground and slowly by slowly we are building it so so basically we'll we'll, we'll talk more about this but it's it's a conversation that we need to have because it's uh it's uh, it has potentially uh, redesigned the future of uh, of education and, and its administration entirely yes thank you thank you so much and i can see you i know you've been having power issues but it's um it's nice to have you uh, how have you been coping i think you're the most um affected person or the most um you know this conversation really hits you because you've been affected in your studies you were doing your phd um your kids are also not going to school you're not uh, physically lecturing because you're a lecturer um how have you how have you been how is everything how are you coping what's the secret to just being sane. Kindly unmute your mic. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, uh, sorry. So yes, as Miriam has said, but I'm in figure de besana. Take all she has said, cut it in half. <laughs> I think you're breaking. And I think you're breaking. There might be a problem with your connection. I think you're breaking. So, yes. Uh, COVID can you hear me now okay yes no it's better oh. yeah please oh, go ahead okay. so, we, did, we didn't catch anything so just start all over again oh my <laughs> <laughs> i guess i was just wrapping so i was saying that goes again in that um we uh, all of you, this, uh, you, you could you could advise her to just remove her video with the audio. <laughs> it will be fine. I know she's been having power uh, issues. Um, the, and if you can hear me, just turn off your video so that we can have a seamless um, interaction. It seems to interfere with your voice. Oh, it's clearer. Okay. Yes, it's clearer. Okay. Oh, it's clearer now. Yes, perfect. Okay. So, as I was saying, um, concurring with what Paul was saying, that mm -hmm. this period has been quite uh, weird, especially the past few weeks. Yes, so uh, just like everybody else, I was quite confused. I was not even understanding what was going on. But then I think um, with the normalcy, right now it's our new normal, right? I hope you can. Yes, we can, we can just carry on. Yes. Um, as I Can try help her set it up. Um, let, let, let us give her a bit of time. Let me just appreciate those of you who have come in now. I was not able to do that. Walter, thank you again for making time today. Walter is from Zizi Africa Foundation. Thank you so much for making time. Cheboy, oh my goodness. We need to have coffee and catch up. Um, Cheboy works for Emerging Leaders Foundation and I'm a fellow of Emerging Leaders Foundation. She is my mentor and a good friend of mine. Thank you for just making time. Cynthia Kanai, I, I know you heard from her yesterday. Thank you for also making time. Angela Mukiri is my mentor. She works at Kenya School of Government. Um, I think most of who I am is because of you. I really look up to you. Thank you. Beryl, 
um, is a student leader at Kenyatta University. Thank you for always making time. And Lea Wangeshi, you've never been late. So thank you so much. Um, we also have another person joining in, Marcy. Thank you for also making time. I don't know if, um, and you've been able to, you know, um, deal with your connection issues. Uh, or should we give you a few more minutes? Um, this is what technology does to you. It can either be on your side or completely against you. So we completely understand, just take time. Um, I know we'll be able to get you back. So I think I'll start off this conversation with Paul as we wait for Anne. Um, you are telling us about the service you've conducted in different parts of the country, and especially the most um, vulnerable parts of our country. Vitu kwa ground zikwaje, just break it down for us, literally. Uh, <clears throat> How bad is the situation? Yeah, so we, we surveyed Turkama and Tana Delta because um, uh, they, are, they, are, they are the two counties, Turkana, Tana Delta, and Gungoma are the three counties that we have our, our interventions in, uh, courtesy our, 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 our member, our, our organization, our, our member organization, which is Easy Africa. Easy Africa is a member of the PAL network. Wow. So, yeah, so uh, we did a survey in Tana Delta and Turkana, and the situation is crazy. Um, there is no internet, uh, households do not have phones. Uh, parents do not know how to read. Uh, so even if they received uh, a text, they wouldn't know. They basically use, if they have a phone, it's for receiving calls, you know, basically. And then there is issues of power. In Turkana, you have to walk about, you have to move four kilometers, six, seven, eight, to get access to a center where you can charge your phone. And, and we were doing this survey to, to address, you know, the learning challenge for those who are farthest left behind. And for us, our philosophy is always to reach out to those fathers left behind. So there are those who are in the urban areas who have access to internet. Some of them are doing Google classes, but then we wanted to reach those who do not have this privilege. So yes, yeah, so, so, so the, uh, the, the findings were, were interesting, were very interesting, a bit shocking as well. Of course, we anticipated some of the things as well, but then the numbers just gave us much more clarity on what we could do. So. From that survey, we were able to initiate an SMS-based learning approach. And then, so, so we could send SMSs to a specific group of parents, a sample size of 55, uh, uh, 15, uh, 25 from uh, Turkana, 30 from Tana Delta, and, and just you know, constantly follow up with the parents to see whether the children are able to learn through SMS, are they able to read, you know, how are they interacting with the children, we change the dynamics of learning you know, a little bit. We move from basic reading to activities of, uh, for example, asking the parent to just have a conversation with the child about farm, farming inputs or uh, you know, in, in Swahili, basically. So, so yeah, so, so those are, that, that is the approach we took. We did the survey, got our findings, uh, tried out SMS. We also have community radios that are, uh, that are uh, on the ground, community radio in Turkana and Tana Delta airing some sessions in, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in Swahili, in those areas. Um, we also, you know, so, so basically, yeah, those are some of the interventions we are looking at. Low cost technology for fathers to reach uh, children because they don't have access to laptops, tablets, anything that, that uses internet. Um, wow. Yeah. Me. Before we continue, I don't know if um, Anne is uh, back. And if you're back, just let me know. But I want to bring Angela into this conversation. She was a speaker yesterday, but just allow me to bring you in. Um, listening to Paul, it's it's heartbreaking. It's sad. In, we are talking about internet connectivity. We are talking about power penetration being very low. D does that mean that our government is ignorant of these things? Uh, Miriam, should I answer that? Yes, please. Ah, well, I don't work with the government, but I don't think they are very ignorant about the matter. Mm -hmm. I, I strongly believe that our government is aware of, of what is happening. What I don't see is the, the political will and a commitment to the people that they serve. Because... Um, it's about, um, there's someone who put it somewhere in a research I was just reading and 
it's about social capital. It's about who is who. So uh, electricity goes to those to, to some particular groupings of people, and probably those who are in Nairobi. We say we are benefiting because um, the government is sitting in Nairobi. So those who are in the cities, we benefit because the county governments are sitting in the cities. But those who are farthest from the what we call the capital cities where there are amenities, then the infrastructure is missing. And um, I think as Kenyans, this is where we go. We start asking ourselves hard questions. And I think one of the things that I have a problem with us Kenyans is that we never get to that point where we want to face ourselves and ask ourselves hard questions. That really, uh, am I being served by this government? I know many people always say that um, we need to be patient, we need to appreciate, and there's a lot of this appreciate patience, um, something narrative. But then again, you ask yourself, someone like a child that my brother here is talking about, that child can never be patient. I mean, she, uh, a child in primary school, in high school, does not have an opportunity to be patient. And especially if you're talking about being patient and waiting for 10 years, and those 10 years are counting in terms of your education. So you're missing out, you're losing because of a system that is telling you to wait and to appreciate the little that they're giving you and all that. So um, we there is no really that commitment. And that's why we need to come out and start raising that more seriously, more objectively, not with emotions, but with objectivity and firmness that we need as a country, as a people. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we keep on saying youth comprise of 70% of the population. And this means we are able to make decisions. We are able to push for change. Now I'm just thinking, listening to what Nicholas, Nicholas from Ipsos was giving us data yesterday from Narok and it's heartbreaking. And we also have Paul and we also have um, a lot of this data on our internet. Um, I don't know if Joy is here. Um, Joy, as a young person, yeah. a leader, mm -hmm. are we not angry enough to keep our leaders accountable, to keep our government accountable? Or are we just ignorant of whatever it is that's going on? But so long as you're comfortable, you don't care what happens to the other person. I think there are so many factors in place. Like. Mm -hmm. First of all, there's the luxury that youth we have. You know, like we're still young, we're waiting for our time. I don't know when our time is, but we're still waiting for it. Mm -hmm. And then kuna gopa that if I start, gaveta come in it in you. You know, like for me, the way I see government operating, it comes to such things like if a youth is very active, they'll try and take them into those youth wings for Kinakanu. Me, I don't be aligned with those ones because they're not like there's no ideology per se. Like there's nothing they're fighting for, you know? Like even this COVID for them, it's a chance for them to ask for budgets and to say, do we need to help people, so give us money. But this COVID issue, there's more about it than just the way it looks. Like if we're really to, sc to scratch this COVID issue, we'll end up even looking at white supremacy. Because if you ask me. Yeah? So youth, I think we need to take more such initiatives are good, like youth poll, or is it poll youth? Then also like working with older people like Anne and Angela, like, you know, when we have such people supporting us, poor, and then we're also confident to like agitate for these issues. And we need like numbers, you know, like youth, we need to come together and actually have ideologies that work for us and for our future, because the future is actually in our hands. So we need to look at a lot of the issues when it comes to youth and policy and engagement because at Kuangi Koyosin. And if we're there, we're in a youth wing under some ignorant politician. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'd like to hear from you guys if you agree with Joy uh, or you, you disagree with her and tell us why you disagree with her. She's saying there's a lot of laxity from young people. Um, that's why we don't hold our, our leaders accountable. Um, she's saying the environment is not. Um, 
very friendly to young people and you fear for your life. That's why you're not able to speak out for your friends. Before I bring Anne, I'd like to just hear what Walter has to say. Walter from the Afrique Foundation. Um, good, good evening, guys. Um, I've had people talking about our, the Kenyan connectivity. Mm -hmm. And uh, some, some funny fact is that Kenya has the highest uh, internet connectivity across uh, sub-Sahara with around 83% uh, comparing to the 24 uh, average. And it also has like the highest electricity uh, coverage with around 75% as per the GSMA uh, research. So uh, my, my, yes, yes, we could have people uh, like the way Paul is saying that uh, still left behind, but the main, the major challenge is not really connectivity. It's, it's, it's more of uh, the income level uh, of the family uh, to, to enable them get this access in terms of phone and internet, uh, phone that can access internet. Uh, also, it could be the challenge of uh, capacity in, in terms of uh, the, the, the capacity, in terms of uh, the parents, the parents illiteracy level, uh, also the the, the 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 schools themselves. Uh, I, I, I'm from an I'm from a university uh, in Kenya. I won't uh, name names because some of uh, the people working there or studying there are here, but we have institutions that are supposed to be institutions with uh, better capacity in terms of uh, lecturer having uh, digital capacities, having uh, knowledge of how to engage uh, their students out of uh, the, the norm that was there pre-corona, but they are still stuck to how it was before. Uh, they, they still wanted to come to, to them for, for uh, for research and all that, instead of having this Zoom session that people are accessing. Okay. Uh, then, 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 then there's, there's also uh, there's also this aspect of people saying that we, the youth, are not holding, uh, are afraid of uh, how the government will react. Yes, government are like teenagers. For me, I would say they are like teenagers. It depends on how you get to them. Uh, it, it, even me as a person as Walter, if you if you come to me shouting because you want your grievances to be heard, I will shut it down. But if you engage the government diplomatically and use it the right channel, then you can get get whatever you need. I, I'm being I'm being asked here by Philbert uh, mm -hmm. uh, if yes we have the best internet. Uh, and Nikienda Nyumbani Airtel Haifani. Yes, Airtel in a poor Haifani, but you're not restricted to using Airtel. There's a, there is Safaricom, there is Telcom. <laughs> it's us just having that fixated mind that we have to do this and someone has to be blamed for something. We, we have to just recognize that yes, there's that challenge, but uh, what can I do with what I have? Even Moses, when he, in the Bible was told, what do you have? And he had a, he had a rod. Mm -hmm. So let's use what we have uh, to get to what we need. Yes, yes, there are challenges, but how can we as youth uh, get to this, this thing without whining? It's more uh, doing, uh, organizing rather than agonizing. I was looking for that word. Okay. Um... Thank you so much, Walter. Walter, for your contribution. Now, um, as I bring Anne in, Naka, I want you to think about this. He's talking about packaging. How do we package ourselves as young people? How do we approach the government? Um, do you think we package ourselves in the right way? If not, what do you suggest? Um, if it's demonstrations, if it's a petition, um, you're a policy expert. Um, guide, guide us on that. Now, Anne, I hope your internet is back. We had lost you for a minute. Hi, uh, not yes. back per se, I've just changed my position. I'm hoping for <laughs> a better outcome. Okay. So I'm not giving up yet, yes. 
so as I want to move this conversation further, and I know we have students here, we have students who are supposed to graduate. I am one of the students who are supposed to graduate, but I have not done that because of COVID-19. And I'm looking at the possibility of a virtual uh, graduation. So you guys, um, people who are listening in, are you, would you be willing, would you be open uh, to a virtual graduation? I just want to hear from you people. And how has online learning be for you, been for you? Um, have your lecturers actually administered, administered learning online? Uh, just let me know. But before that, how has it been in JQuart? Um, despite COVID-19, have you been able to administer learning online? And how has that experience been for you, Anne? OK. Uh, thanks, Miriam. Uh, actually, uh, the remote learning, distance learning, e-learning, online, whichever terminology you want to use, uh, personally, I am loving it <laughs> and loving it because uh, one, I don't have to dress up to go nowhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Two, I am always late for class, so I don't have to be late for class. <laughs> I have no reason, literally. Uh, three, I am saving on a lot of fuel uh, for my commute there. So has it been a good thing? Yes. Uh, Jekwet actually has really tried because in the beginning when we were, uh, when they fronted the idea, uh, it was more because uh, other universities were kind of doing it and we could not be left behind or we wanted to be part of it. Uh, so there was a lot of, uh, lot of uh, like from the lecturers even, yeah? Like uh, how impossible it will be or uh, is this fair for the students? Of course it's not, yeah? On, on some sides. But as I, I want to concur with Walter with what he said that Sometimes we have to push ourselves uh, for the extra mile, yeah? Because if you're willing, uh, I know things like internet are not as cheap, especially if you're not doing the Wi-Fi home connectivity, or maybe you live, uh, I don't want to say Bundus, but somewhere that uh, internet is not uh, such a package, yeah? So, um, but if you look at it from, um, from this point of view, where let's say you used to live in school or, within the neighborhoods of school and right now you don't have to pay rent because you're at home how about to use that cash to do what to sign up for class yeah like to sit down for an online class and this is something you can literally have anywhere uh you can have it in your parents cars you can have it uh in your bedroom you can have it like literally it has that flexibility that is there now um of course there are certain challenges that we cannot uh, pretend uh to not see uh, issues like uh, digital divide, which are real, yeah, where we are saying there are people who, there are the haves and the have nots. Uh, there are people who have access to ICT and there are people who also don't have access to ICT. So we can't uh, shy away from that. Um, we can also talk about, uh, I think even, uh, I think it was Walter who pointed on that, where he said uh, some of our lecturers even, yeah, where we are, we are still not, we don't want to move, yeah? We don't want to move, we don't want to, uh, to embrace this period. We will still want to stay in our, in our comfort zone, which we were at for a very long time, but the times are different. Everybody is adapting to something. And believe it or not, right now, uh, when it comes to having ICT with you, it's not a matter of, um, what is it called? It's something nice to have, like using technology. No, 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 no. We are in the age where, Technology is a must have. It's an integral part of our living. So I think if we were more concerned with, uh, do we want to do our studies? Do we want to graduate, yeah? Do we want to do all these things? We could actually do it, yeah? Uh, look at uh, the Western world. 90% uh, of these guys are in school and nothing is being affected. Like they're reading every day from our kindergarten to, uh, to, to the, to the uh, higher learning they're doing their thing, yeah? But in Kenya, we are paralyzed, like literally, we are just there, we are shifting around, we are saying online uh, learning is uh, optional. If you want to come to class, you should come to class. If you don't feel like this is your thing, then it's, no, we should move with the times, yeah? Actually, if this was changed and we didn't have to go to school, <laughs> as Paul was saying earlier, like we don't have to go to work anymore. I mean, I mean, like, I think this is something that can actually work. We just need to look at where should we sacrifice or what bit should we sacrifice so that we can be able to adapt to what is happening right now. 
Thank Does you that make so any much. sense? Yes, it makes so much sense. But I want to hear from people. Um, there are a few comments I'm reading here. I think everyone can also read that. Joy is saying virtual graduation takes all the fun from a physical graduation. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking you don't have photos um, to you know share on social mm -hmm. media. Um, um, Morris says, yeah, a virtual graduation is okay. Any graduation is a graduation. And now I want to ask, um, Anne says it is doable. You can sacrifice rent and join a class. There was an attempt by the University of Nairobi and a few other universities to administer on, um, online learning, but it was faced with a lot, lot of, you know, they boycotted, they, they did a strike on Twitter for a whole day they were trending. I don't know if you have anyone from the University of Nairobi. I had invited a few um, or just any other university. And I just want to know why um, online learning is being faced with a lot of resentment from new people. Let us know. Yes, I can see someone from University of Nairobi, but I won't mention names. Just let us know how your experience has been, what are the challenges you're facing, and uh, having a conversation is one way of solving it. We can, we have people here um, who work in universities, they can table that um, to the management and then we'll be able to see. Before um, I get your views and your feedback, um, I want to bring Paul in, because um, he has background in um, learning assessment. So when you're talking about quality education, there are specific indicators, there are specific um, KPIs, there's a threshold that is supposed to be met. And we have um, tools to you know, ensure that happens. But when you're talking about online learning, how do we ensure education is um, of good quality, of, uh, you know, it's, it's beneficial to the student? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Miriam. Um, I just saw a comment on the chat that I wanted to quickly react to. Someone was saying that uh, government should should not uh, use the reactive approach on virtual learning. So, uh, that we need to prepare for it, and I'm wondering um, how well we can prepare for it when we have COVID-19 around. So it's about embracing what we have and moving on. <laughs> so. Um, on to your question, um, we have, uh, there are indicators, different countries define uh, quality education in different ways. And, and there are different parameters that define quality education. There is matters context, basically um, the, 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 the background, where, where do these children come from? Uh, uh, what is their profile? Uh, what is the level? What, what do they already know by the time they're coming to school? There is matters of input. Uh, how much I know how you know how well is the input process designed? Basically, these are materials for learning and how these materials are distributed. Then there's the aspect of process, how is the learning executed? Are the learners involved? And then there is the outcome bit of how we achieved the outcome level for children in grade one, for example. Are they able to do basic literacy? Are they able to read uh, to you know to do basic numeracy? So there are those levels and um, and when COVID-19 knocked, it uh, literally it literally disintegrated uh, the, the the what we knew as the education system, where it was a very direct system where a child showed us shows us in school, which is a structure, and then there is a teacher, and then there is interaction during the classroom, and then and then at the end of the day, the child goes home with some homework, they learn, but now with online learning that is disrupted, so uh, we sit back and realize, okay. So our education system is designed in a way that children cannot learn remotely, you know. So um, online learning, especially online learning has been really um, helpful for children within the urban areas, basically those who have access, uh, who have been doing Google classes and whose parents are well educated. Uh, the parents are able to engage their children in learning. The parents are able to do some games. The, some parents are really creative. They they able to you know to make some charts for children to play and learn with. Uh, and and I'm, I'm at this point I'm talking about children in the lower in the lower primary level. Mm -hmm. um, but then, in as much as this is happening, in as much as this is happening in this uh, in this uh, well organized uh, institutions, some indicators become difficult to track in online learning. 
especially indicators that involve in child interaction because children learn a lot from interacting from play there is learning through play children are playing and singing and they are you know they are acquiring content so those are hard to track at this point we you know you're just giving a child some tasks through a virtual con uh, interaction and then and then they're able to do some basic assessments but then your your input is really limited unless the parent is is probably educated to to support the child to transition from one level to another that transition is very important because it's 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 the border between what a child knows and what they do not know it's it's called the zone of proximal development so for them to transition they need a very a very organized form of instruction and that's where the role the teacher plays and and, and sometimes you can't achieve this through an through a virtual interaction in as much though and that's where the parents who are quite learned are able to support teachers to support these children to be able to make that transition so yes so the biggest challenge of course has been to the children who are fathers left behind those who have never seen a tablet in their life those whose parents did, never, did not even go to school and 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 and, and when and, we, and when we were having the conversation yesterday about teenage pregnancies i was thinking this is something that has a domino effect because this teenage mother uh, they are likely going to drop out of school if there's a very slim chance that they'll be able to go back to school because they now have a bigger responsibility so they end up you know grow, raising a child but then they are not at well advanced themselves educationally, even socially. So they, there's a lot of misses, you know, in the, when they're raising this child. And then now this child is in a situation like we are in now, where they need to learn remotely and there is no support that the parent can give. And so 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 these are so so basically the challenge we are we are seeing at this point is that uh, there is so much thinking that needs to go into place and government needs to be very deliberate about reaching this country 100% because there is no equality when 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 children in Turkana are still not getting access to uh, they are not connected to the grid and the Walter was saying 75% are connected but if there is a if there is a, a four kilometer distance to you know for for if, before you get to a place where there is power uh, you know that's just a grid that's passing through a community you know it's, it's it's it has nothing to do with the people who are living underneath so, so let us be very deliberate on, on some of these, so these, these solutions and be very you know, detailed so that we, we are able to help each and every person. I don't know if that kind of like answers the question, but yes, it's really hard to track uh, the, uh, the indicators on quality education through online learning. Basically what institutions are trying is to, to provide access. At this point, people are just providing access. Then after providing access, now slowly by slowly we are building uh, tech, tech learning indicators, indicators that can help measure education from a virtual perspective. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to bring uh, Cheboy. Cheboy, just allow me to bring you in. You're an you're a student from University of Nairobi. How has it been for you? Um, and what do you think students are facing? Um, you know, for them to boycott efforts from the management to administer online learning. Thank you so much, uh, Beatrice. So for me, the start was awesome because I'm introverted, I love my space. So not going to school and not going to work was awesome for me. But then came the introduction of online classes, which was okay. A couple of our lecturers were good to go, but a couple of them struggled. I take six units and three were on with it and it was awesome but three really struggled but what bothered us most was almost half the class was not able to attend because most of our uh, almost half the class are refugees from Kakuma and Adab so you find someone tries to connect and then they drop off and try to connect and can't get anything which is really really very sad and the boycott was basically a couple of students are very sure that they will miss out on exams because of the power outages and the connectivity problems from where they are. But the university is like, um, if you know you need to walk three kilometers to where you can find connectivity to sit your exams, leave your house at 5 a.m., walk to the place where there is connectivity or take a bus. 
but are they even considering that these students may not have transport or fare to take a bus to where they are supposed to sit exams or something? That was what the APRO was all about. Yeah. So I can say it has been good, but it has a bit aside in that we are leaving behind our classmates, our teammates that we need to move forward with. And that is what is bothering most of us. Though the online exams have been slated to start uh, 20th of July, a couple of students went to court to, you know, stop the online exam. So we are waiting. We don't know what will happen next, but we are hoping for the best. Thank you, Betis. Thank you so much, Eboy, for your contribution. Um, a part of me feels like um, there is a communication breakdown between, um, say, for example, management from institutions of higher learning and um, students, because th they don't entirely know or understand what the students are going through. And then at the same time, these students don't know how to channel or are not channeling um, their sentiments in a proper way. Um, Ndaka, I don't know if you, you can just um, say something about that. As you also give us a case study, you're in New Zealand, you're continuing your PhD studies seamlessly. I've seen people abroad graduating um, virtually. What is it that those people are doing, we are not doing in Kenya? Uh, uh, when I listen to Cheboy and probably what Paul has been talking about, uh, although Walter talked about very much about big connectivity, and of course, there is a lot of data showing that there's big connectivity in, um, in Kenya and high subscription. Actually, last year, last quarter of 2019, they were showing over 100% subscription in terms of um, calls, people phone, phone calling or people who on a line for calling and almost 100% subscription for internet, meaning that we entirely have 45, over 45 million people owning or being able to access internet in Kenya and all that. But the question is, who are these people that are accessing internet? When you listen to your boy, Paul, our problems are very basic, very basic, like very basic, because um, we are talking about access. We are not even struggling with higher issues like privacy, like how the technicality of the exams and all that. We actually struggling with issues of access in terms of money, in terms of um, uh, where am I going to take this examination? Is there a reliable internet? Is there all this power and all that, all those disruptions? And the communication, um, burying our heads under the sand and assuming that uh, the student must make an effort to go and sit for an examination, for me, I, I find that a little bit um, um, disturbing. Disturbing in the sense that uh, someone like um, the kind of children that Paul, Paul's organization is dealing with. We are talking about basic education. In Kenya, we are saying, we have actually claimed that we are offering free basic education. In the last uh, uh, months, of COVID-19, kids have not been going to school. So uh, definitely we've been saving in terms of money as a country, I believe so. And that money could be channeled in supporting families that cannot afford that infrastructure, that kind of uh, access to internet. Because uh, people are making efforts to ensure that families are connected bundles. People are, if, if, I'm, if I work for an organization, for example, they have to send me bundles, money for bundles so that I can be able to do their work. If the government sponsors a student, uh, the basic education, they should be able to avail that, um, that, that uh, uh, make available internet. And even if it means that doing the social distancing and allowing students to have little uh, pocket, po packets of 10 students, having been able to access education uh, and internet and they fund that system. How we do this, 
I believe gov government can do it through schools. But anyway, uh, going back to uh, to how uh, to 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 the disconnect between uh, the institutions and and uh, the students. I believe that for such a project to be actualized, for such um, an online exam to be actualized, people need to listen to one another. People need to listen to, uh, the, the administration need to hear what the students are going through. We had an example of something that happened here. An institution refused to sit for online examination and uh, not because of lack of access for internet, but because of, um, uh, they, 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 there was a monitor that was to be fitted in, the, in their computers in terms of a software, um, artificial intelligence stuff. And it was supposed to monitor them sitting for the examination, which means you are supposed to connect this software to your, 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 all your emails. You are supposed to connect it to your uh, a computer camera, you're supposed to connect it to everything, every communication channel that is within your computer. And so that means that the, the software has an access to your room where you're sitting. So no one can come in, no one can uh, talk to you, no one can communicate to you, no one can send you anything through your email or even WhatsApp and all that. So people felt that one was a an intrusion of their privacy. And in that one, I think it's at a higher level because people, at the institutions have to ensure, have to ensure that everyone had access to internet. Where people did not have access to internet, emails were sent around, communicating to every student and giving them an opportunity to come and book with the administration to be given a computer within the institution. And the, the, uh, the university administration was supposed to ensure that the social distancing is maintained so that there are computer labs where people can be spaced, uh, like the meters that are required and they are able to sit for the exam. And in a room, you are allowed enough people so that you're not so much congested and all that. So, um, I feel in as much as we want to excuse uh, our, our systems, we still, I still feel that the universities, much as they want to be seen to be implementing um, online learning, they also need to listen to the student because I don't want to fail my exams because I did not have an access to internet. I mean, I'm not like, I will not be uh, um, examined fairly if I walked at five o'clock to access internet through the in the next market. And when I get there, probably electricity, there is a blackout that day and the examination stops in the middle. And that time there's someone who is going through the examination smoothly, that is not fair. The, that is not fairness. Fairness is when, actually, let me not talk about fairness. Let me talk about equity or justice, because uh, fairness, people understand it differently. That is because that person is not being given, is struggling to get the education, is actually paying a higher cost to do that an exam compared to a person who is comfortably sitting in Nairobi, where they have very good and strong network and they comfortably sit for their examination so it's like we are facing the same examination but i have to pay higher cost because i am poor because i come from a marginalized community compared to a person who comes in a more resourced communities and all that so i feel those basic issues need to be addressed and that's why you institution come in and they offer all the they supplement, they, they provide um, infrastructure for those students who cannot have the infrastructure or who do not have the infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, you so much. Um, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, before we start talking solution, uh, 
because we've been talking problems, the better part of the conversation, which is a good thing because we're identifying what is wrong. Now I want us to start talking solutions. Before we do that, I can say um, a lot of heat on our wall. I think I'll channel this question to Anne. When you're talking science subjects, when you're talking practical subjects like engineering, how, yes. and I think I ask you this as a lecturer and as an IT expert, how do we ensure the same information is related to students and the same um, impact goes to students during this time when you're talking virtual learning? Is it possible to administer some of these subjects online? You lecture IT. There's a lot yes. of um, practical, programming. Uh, yes, exactly, programming and everything. Is it yes. possible to do that online? Or are we compromising some of some of these very crucial subjects? Uh, truth be told, um, okay. First, I want to agree so much with what uh, Angela has said. Uh, the unfairness in everything. Uh, when it comes to um, the quality of what we are offering, uh, I think theoretical subjects can be administered online comfortably. Uh, that is, I'm assuming everything. Uh, is standardized all through, like uh, all students are able to connect, uh, they're able to uh, to get uh, to class uh, with the right instruments. I'm not being naive, I'm just saying that uh, generally, but when it comes to the practical lessons, uh, that is a whole other array of issues that is there, yeah? So what I think is that I don't think uh, the university, and I'm, trust me, I'm not trying to we talk enough uh, <laughs> during our meetings, yeah? We pressure them enough on these issues, yeah? But um, what is the alternative, yeah? Is the alternative uh, to sit and not do anything, yeah? Mm -hmm. Or is it to try on some things? Because I think uh, some of these practical uh, classes can be pushed maybe to other semesters because we have done this before. Like if uh, a class doesn't have enough students in a quorum, yeah? We, we tend to even take them to the next class so that they can have uh, people and you're not deterred from being in school. So no, I will not say that uh, it will be fair or people will receive what they're supposed to receive. But on theoretical uh, classes, I think those can proceed or we can try to do the best we can do with what we, we have. You see, the problem is uh, what if we sit for months, yeah? And uh, nothing is happening, yeah? We are talking about very many young people or young minds out there idle, doing absolutely nothing. Yeah, because uh, how many people, how many young people? And I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to kuingilili uh, awatu, but how many people will push themselves to even learn new things of uh, uh, the YouTube University? N not so many, yeah, because structure is needed. Yeah. So what I think uh, universities are trying to do is that. Uh, apart from them being seen as they are trying to adapt something online, uh, there is the, advant the advantageous part where they're trying to, uh, to do what? To push yeah? people to at least be doing something, at least something to be running, which I don't think is totally the worst thing. But on uh, engineering uh, courses, uh, of course, I'm not an expert on that. I can imagine guys like food science who do a lot of practicals, like literally all their classes are pr practicals. I mean, that is totally uh, insane if we try to say that we can administer that online, yeah? But on some of these theoretical things, I think we can try to pick and choose, yeah? What we can do to push and what you can push back and not be able to do as we, because uh, the, the, the thing is, we are hoping this won't last forever, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So I think we are, we are at that position, yeah. But uh, of course, the unfairness of... Uh, accessibility is really a huge deal. And, uh, and the way we, we tried to push our students back to school was quite, uh, lack of better words, tacky, yeah? Because uh, what we did is that uh, even for us, yeah, we were just being motioned by administration. Like, okay, you guys, we are starting online classes. This thing is happening. You either, uh, you're in or you're in. So no option is given, yeah? So uh, personally for me, when I attend, I, I have done, I, I, I do all my classes actually online, yeah? And I, I make sure, because I feel like it's my duty uh, to, if, if someone is there and they're willing to learn, it's my duty to do it, to give them the service that I get paid for, 
yeah so is it unfair for the other uh, guys who are not able to do this of course uh, i can't even imagine people walking distances i mean we take a lot for granted yeah i can't imagine people walking distances just to access uh, electricity or even internet or even even connectivity yeah but at the same time we can't just sit around yeah we have to move partly with the ones who can yeah as we figure out what we can do for the rest Thank you so much, Anne. Um, how many minutes do you have? We have 15 minutes and we'll make the most of it. So, and I know I'll, I'll, I'll get a backlash from these guys. I had given them questions I will ask, but I don't think I have asked any questions. I just like to move with the flow, um, which is a really good thing. Uh, from everything we are talking about, I have Um, we are talking, and I've, I've, I've picked this from the wall, we are having a lot of um, discussion on do we have connectivity, do we not have connectivity, so I feel like we have a gap when it comes to data, we don't have current accurate data of what is actually going, going on in the ground, um, if, if we were able to get accurate data from the Ministry of Education and whatnot and then come up with solutions from that, so we lack as a country in current accurate data, different organizations have different you know volumes of data but can that be compiled and uh, now i'm giving solutions uh, which is you guys are supposed to give solutions so you, we are talking about lack of current data we are talking communication breakdown you know, between the students between universities between lecturers um if we could have a seamless um channel of communication um we are talking equality and equity which is a very important aspect uh, we are talking separating theoretical subjects with practical subjects in uni. Um, now, I want solutions from you people, uh, from everything I have said, from everything you've, you've heard our speakers say. You're a young generation, we have young minds in here. Let's talk solutions now. I'll start with Paul. Thank you, thank you, Miriam. Um, for me, I'll just dive into it. Um, I feel like uh, from, for us, for the population we are dealing with, and uh, from the perspective of uh, the work I, uh, I do, is, uh, is on the building and foundation bit. And, in, and as we are building foundation, we are exploring interactive technology where children can use tablets. Basically, we are thinking hybrid technology, which is a mixture of two models. It's like a, a vehicle running on petrol, but also has electricity. So we are looking at how children can learn on their own using interactive platforms. So it's using animations and as many dynamics in IT as possible so that they can be able to learn. So this kind of like gives an answer to the question that people are having about how do engineering students learn virtually? <clears throat> First of all, we realize that um, uh, God has been gracious, there's a huge chance that uh, things are going to be normal eventually. So people are going, are going back to classes. But then what, what, what the challenge that is left behind is how do we design ourselves in a, in a way that if this was to happen again, we would be prepared. And even as we prepare, even as we do that, we are preparing with the mind that um, we have a generation that's coming that will be highly technophilic, meaning uh, they'll be doing most of the things online. So uh, this group of people uh, may actually not go on Twitter because they will have had this from an earlier background to handle this. Because you know, when it comes abruptly, it's also startling. You can't just uh, you know, uh, push people to the wall with something that's relatively new. It needs a bit of uh, traveling. The other thing I'm thinking is um, you know, modeling learning sessions that are very, as, as I said, we are modeling learning you know, systems that can re are, children can really engage with that have songs and all that kind of things. And they're very contextual, meaning we are not teaching, uh, you know, English songs in Turkana. They will be singing songs in Turkana using these systems. So then more, these kind of models, you know, basically it's taking us to work of research. Uh, Tibet institutions need to get down to research. Universities need to get down to research. This is where IT, depa IT departments across the country in all the major universities need to be having sleepless nights, figuring out how they're going to model the future learning of this country. The other thing is about um, 
I've talked about creativity and innovation. I've talked about research. The other thing about you know being able to use education to mitigate these issues in the future is uh, building the capacity of uh, children. You know, building the capacity of children in good time. So uh, uh, let me explain this small bit in, in in about two minutes. Now, in our work, we don't use the mainstream education system to build the capacity of children. We assess children between grade one to grade five, and then we group them according to their learning levels, not according to class. So meaning a child is in class five, but cannot read grade two work, we will group them in that level where they are. And then we teach children to be at the, at the right level with everyone else, so that you are giving individualized assignments to every child. So then that also inspires to, you know, the way we will develop our, our technological learning pedagogy where it is very individual oriented. So that uh, I'm, I'm looking at a future where you would be doing your chemistry, you know, practicals at home with a camera, you know, it's possible. But yes, basically let us embrace the technology called, uh, up, you know, upgrade that's coming up. Uh, government has a lot to do when it comes to widening up infrastructure. Uh, I agree with Walter that there is connectivity, but then the connectivity is not equal, meaning Nairobi has 4G, Machakos has 3G, Matu has 2G, other counties have GPRS. And if you have ever used GPRS, you know the frustration that it has with connectivity. Thank you so much, Miriam. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Um, before I um, I, I, I tell, I, I give Anne an opportunity. I'd like to read what Alta has to say. And he says, my solutions, number one, advocate for zero rating of learning platforms. Number two, change the perception of youth on online learning. So we need paradigm shifts there. Number three, reintroduce the laptop project to allow for accessibility of learning, uh, learning resources. Number four, learn from countries that have done, uh, con that have done, um, you know, that have been able to administer learning online. Um, very, very beautiful comments there. I think everything you guys are saying will be able again to compile it and then put it in one document and produce it as a solution um, alternative to their to their respective you know authorities. Anne. Yes. <laughs> uh, solutions. Solutions. Okay, uh, realistic solutions at the moment. Um, I think we need to, to allow ourselves to, uh, to try and adapt uh, like unfamiliar technology. Yeah? Uh, for example, uh, at JCOT right now, we are using what you call Kenneth uh, as a model for, so we are not using Zoom or all that, yeah? We're using Kenneth as a model for, for the teaching, yeah? So I think if you, if any student is privileged, yeah, to be, to, to have connectivity and to be able to, to do this from their home, yeah, and to be able to, uh, to, to, be able to get it, they should take advantage of it, yeah? Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the fact that uh, some people maybe don't have the same opportunity. Uh, the other thing, uh, I think uh, we should also give it a chance, yeah? Give it a chance because I think uh, the first thing as human beings we do, anytime something is coming, uh, a change is coming, we are ready to, you know, to say all the no's, to be dramatic about it, to, so let's give it a chance as young people. Uh, on the institution part, I think uh, orienting, because uh, even uh, like um, the older generation of lect uh, lecturers have problems when it comes to this. Uh, so even orienting them, yeah, like, uh, like there's that uh, digital illiteracy that is there. Yeah, so because I heard someone saying that uh, three of their lecturers are having issues with it. Yeah, so digital illiteracy is a real thing. Yeah, so maybe uh, not just jumping on things, but actually trying to orient our staff and also our, our students on these things. Yeah, just because I'm young, it doesn't mean that I am so savvy when it comes to technology. So I, I think someone would feel better if they are already someone is taking them through just the same way we do uh, orientation on our first day of school. Yeah, so I think orienting our, our students on this and showing them that it's not a scary thing. It's actually better because you're even more confident. Yeah, people who are shy in class to speak. Yeah, because uh, even when I'm having my interactive uh, classes with my students, yeah, nowadays if I, 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 I'm having classes of 80 students. And uh, if I ask a question like, guys, what do you think about this? Or what do you term this as? And I just tell you, don't even talk, just type it down, chat it down. And you can see like people are more, 
yeah so it's not all bad yeah so I think just changing our attitude towards it would be a good thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, I've seen university trying to do it, uh, like trying to give uh, our students uh, like bundle offers or uh, uh, like ours has tried to do that, uh, bundles offers or ways in which we can, we can, we can, uh, we can have more connectivity with our students. Yeah, so I think the university should actually take it upon itself, yeah? And also reduce on uh, things like school fees, like what they're asking people, because if guys are not really coming in and they're using all these facilities, I think if I tell you, if you're this semester, you pay three quarters of what you normally pay. That is also attractive to parents, yeah? So I think just orienting the, the, all of the stakeholders, like, hey guys, uh, listen, we, we need to do something about this and everyone needs to be part of the conversation. So when you do that, there's more accountability, not only on the students' part, but also on the parents who are pushing the students, like, have you had your classes today and all that? Yeah, and also now our administration will feel the need to be able to do what, to, to, to try and do more, yeah? Uh, last but not least, just increasing on our productivity, yeah? Just trying to be more productive on all areas, uh, even suggesting, uh, tools because uh, again we are more versatile in what we uh, we we know that is out there so i think even as uh, uh, students i'm also a student uh, as a students we can give more uh, options yeah like uh, okay we see this is not happening this way or what we have seen happening in other countries and guys are doing this how ca how how about we try and adapt it so i think those are reasonable but is it a mountain yes uh, is it a hill no uh, is it uh, difficult? Yes, but can we do something about it? I think we can. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you, Anne. Um, before we move on, in the interest of time, I cannot wrap up this conversation with how, without getting sentiments from a young person. Okay, we are all young at heart, but um, <laughs> someone who's been affected. And I want to feel, but you, you, you're, there's a lot of um, interaction going on. How has the experience been for you? What do you suggest as um, solutions to the same? Uh, hey, Miriam. Let me just ask first, have you had online learning? No, not really. Okay. Uh -huh. um, the, the only engagement has been um, other, other inst uh, institutions, foreign ones, which are offering uh, online classes, which are not really through Zoom, but uh, sites where they post stuff and, and you study on your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it has been amazing. Uh, with all the time you have, you have a whole day, you can even change your, your class to study at night and do other things during the day. It's not like uh, going to school during the day, so it's, it's really nice. Okay. Yeah, um, but uh, as Anne was saying, there are, as we move forward, the, the universities need to put more effort and, and give entice students to actually want to do this. If I'm going to be staying at home, I would be happy if, if I'm not paying as much, I'm not enjoying the facilities in the school. I can't pay the same amount as I was paying before. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Someone also had suggested, I think it was Joy, um, can we channel all the school fees that was initially going to food and everything else? Can we instead give these resources to students as bundles and as bus fare and everything else? I want to hear from you guys, is that a viable solution? Um, Angela, I want to bring you in as the last person who will speak. Um, I'm thinking, we have so many solutions, but we don't have a proper task force to implement it. Um, can we think of uh, maybe um, getting a task force from government in that it represents all universities and not JQuad thinking, um, we can use such and such a platform to benefit our students alone and KU thinking no, um, us will just relax and wait for the government until next year and we'll have Desta probably administer online classes. And some of these private universities have been able to actually you know, complete their semesters and they are now moving on to another semester. Do you think we need to have a 
one task force that represents all universities for you know uniformity uniformity and universe for it to be universal in a way please unmute your mic thank you yes. um sorry for that i think we already have uh, a commission Mm -hmm. And I think it's because many times we have not seen the role of this commission. Commissions are actually supposed to be more of representing um, different stakeholders who are affected by that level of engagement. And we have Commission of University of Education, whose role has always been framed as uh, pushing for quality education in uh, higher universities, in higher levels of learning and chartering uh, universities. But I think going further, Commission of University Education needs to, needs to stretch their role further because being a commission, it's supposed to be representing all kinds of stakeholders from students to parents to um, uh, lecturers and uh, universities, both uh, private and public, so that you are not just looking like, um, how do I put it? They look like, um, even ask Anne, they look like they're always holding a kiboko against the unis and all that. But then again, they, yeah, they should be a commission that should be looking at how do we ensure that the infrastructure in the universities is working for the benefit of the student who is the main stakeholder. So I don't, I, in my opinion, I wouldn't recommend a new task force. I would say that that commission, the Commission of University Education should take up that role and ensure that there is a, a bigger push for um, a fairness, equity and all this infrastructure taking place in the unis. And, and then we can have a balanced conversation because they are also uh, looking at the quality and um, they are looking at quality assurance of education in private universities too. So that moving forward, that is how I would look at it. So is, was that the question that I was supposed to respond to? Yes. Yeah. And there's a question that asked me a long time, but I never responded to it any. Anyhow, I can leave it at that. <laughs> no, just are we packaged? Are we how do we package ourselves as young people to put our leaders to account and you know such a commission because we are the main stakeholders, the commission for university education? Mm, I would say that you the uh, the most polarized group uh, population, eh? biggest, most powerful, most potent that uh, very polarized and uh, one of the secret of having a voice is is being able to coalesce together uh, do things together work together and have a voice um i i don't know what walter meant when he said diplomatic i i'm not uh, I, do, I don't believe in some, sometimes, I don't know whether diplomacy works very well when it comes to governance issues, but also I wouldn't push for issues like throwing stones, um, strikes that you end up burning cars and all that crap. But ideas where you communicate uh, your opinions articulately, when you listen to what your boy was speaking about, is these students had genuine issues, but then it's very easy for administration to rubbish them uh, and, and to push them aside and all that. But if, if and, and then that in that conversation, you find fears like what Joey was bringing, like fear of being killed and all that stuff. So uh, young people tend to run away from facing these and uh, failing to face the systems because you fear to die. I think if we are around, I, we, can, we can tell you that you will not die very soon. Because I think some of us have, have done crazy things, challenge systems, and, and, and that time you're doing it as an individual and, and you speak. So I, I don't think there's someone who is going to kill you for, for, for following the constitution. 
just always remain on the right side of the constitution. Really, Joy, I am. I can say that one authoritatively. There is a whole bill that talks about how you can dialogue with government and learning your rights from that bill. I sometimes I think I would like to share that sometimes, sometimes later, how we can engage government and the rights that we have uh, constitutionally. And you will be shocked by some of the clauses that are coming out of those bills, uh, which are already act now which protect you as a person to be able to challenge and engage government and all that. Only that you don't engage by throwing stone at a person, but the day you quote um, clauses of constitution to a leader, that's the day they open their eyes and realize they're dealing with people who are knowledgeable. So uh, for us, package yourself with what the law says, which is what many people do not read, they don't read what the constitution says. You don't go to what many bills and acts are saying in terms of protecting you. And um, also form coalitions. I beg you, form coalitions. You can only speak with a louder voice when you have coalitions. Let no, let not, uh, let's not look at life like I get a job, I become a manager, uh, uh, I don't have to join Miriam because she's struggling with uh, not getting a job, that's why she's very idle and all that. I think if it was about being idle, some of us would not be here. I am crazily busy, I'm running a job and a PhD and, and I am a student and I'm a parent and all that. Uh, staff, yet I still feel that I must talk because if I don't talk, I will have denied a big generation something that they would have had from me. So um, what I'm saying that youth, can you form coalitions, networks? Paul Youth is one stage that all of you can come join as membership and push for a one agenda, push for your voice to be heard because the more you become, the more you speak, the more people that realize that you are not dispensable. And then the other thing about youth, we need to be consistent. When, uh, when you start speaking about something, when you have an ideology, don't leave it because a politician has promised you to become a PA. Please don't become a PA. A person with a, a degree, you don't deserve that low position of becoming a PA to a person who does not have a degree. I think we have understood when you can wait until you get a job or you can build your own venture and push for it. I am happy for the young people that are starting companies by faith and pushing their agenda. Because when you have your own resources, you can push for your own agenda. So be consistent in terms of what you're saying. Don't, don't keep changing stakes because a politician has appeared here. Keep that consistency because that consistency is what is going to uh, give us uh, good outcomes and all that. Be firm, be friendly, but speak what your heart, you think, what you think is good for the future. Think about the next 50 years. Think about the next generation. I think you'll have a legacy to leave behind. Thank you. Gosh, I cannot, I cannot add more. I do not even want to water down. That was a perfect and a very beautiful conclusion. Um, I am reading Cheboy's sentiments. Thank you so much. Uh, you're saying this is an inter a very good conversation. Um, your network is your net worth. I completely agree. Uh, consistency is key. As we conclude, I have. I've actually run out of time. Um, gosh, again, I have so much, so many notes from yesterday's session and today's session. If I can just wrap up, uh, I'm not able to read all your comments, but we'll have them and we'll take all your sentiments into consideration. Um, when you're talking about inconsistency in data, we're talking about communication breakdown. Uh, we are talking about um, equity and equality. Some of the solutions you guys have given, um, can we, think of remodeling our learning sessions and um, building capacity. Uh, can we talk, can we embrace technology and technological upgrade as young people, as students, as, as lecturers? Um, can we deal with digital illiteracy, both 
our teachers, parents, and students? Um, can we channel the resources that are already there? Uh, you know, in enabling our students to access virtual learning because we don't know how long COVID-19 is here with us. Um, we need to talk about increasing productivity. We need to hold um, some of our institutions like the Commission of University Education um, to, you know, just stretch their role further and push for equity and fairness in both public and private universities. Um, and we're talking about young people. Uh, we are usually viewed as a very polarized group? Can we think of forming collisions and coming together to speak in one voice? Only then can we, you know, um, uh, become greater and, uh, you know, make um, impact, positive impact at that. So at that point, um, I do not like eating into people's time. Allow me to end it there. As I said, if you posted your comments on the wall, we will sit to that. We'll sit together as a group, as a team, and put your your thoughts um, in a document and share with you guys. Um, Joy, I see you. Um, <laughs> I will read that later. <laughs> now, Madam Daka, you you've just signed up for another session with us. Uh, you've said uh, you can teach us as young people on how to package ourselves and actually present ourselves to government and to other organizations as people who are not very, um, you know, not united. So if you're listening, look out for that. We will tell you when. We will set a date and invite all of you and have another session. This has been really, really amazing from yesterday and today. I mean, your time will not to waste, we will see what to do with all this information. Um, as I conclude, let me thank all of you once again for making time for the past two days. If you were not there yesterday, I think we have a recording um, on YouTube and on Facebook. Feel but just guide me if that is right. Yes, we have a recording on Facebook. You can get yesterday's session there. Feel free to share. Um, we've shared our Facebook and Twitter and um, Instagram platforms. Just follow us uh, for more updates for the things we, we are doing. I hope you're following on your phones. Um, that is at Polius Kenya, Polius KE on Instagram, Polius on Twitter, at Polius KE on Facebook. We also have a, an, a, a, a YouTube channel. Is it Youth in Policy? Yes, just feel free to subscribe. We'll have this and many more sessions in future. It was a pleasure and an honor moderating this session. I want to thank our two uh, speakers for today, Mr. Paul Labok. I know we'll have interactions in future. We have to talk about TVET and uh, the role and do we need to shift our thinking from universities to TVETs and boosting capacity and all that. Um, Madam Daka, it is always a pleasure. You're a friend to Polius, a member, um, and we love you. We appreciate your time. Um, Madam Anne, 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 Anne Wende, it is always a pleasure just having you and speaking to you and having conversations with you. Um, keep mentoring, keep uh, inspiring this generation. Uh, and for everyone who showed up, I don't know if I can just mention names, my team, my technical team, um, we have Philbert. I keep calling Philbert. <laughs> I think I'm working, but Philbert, thank you for ensuring we had a seamless, you know, um, a conversation. And Jabez, thank you so much. You guys do such an amazing things and putting us live on Facebook. I know we have people who are viewing us on on Facebook Live. Um, I also want to thank you, um, Pastor Joy. Uh, you're a favorite. We we appreciate you. Thank you for your contribution. Cheboy, thank you so much for making time. I feel honored and humbled. Um, Walter, Walter, Walter will be having a session with, with um, Zizi Afrik and I'll, I'll keep you guys posted. Thank you for always making time. Marvin, Angela, can I just give you one minute to say hi to people? Madam Angela Mukiri, this is my mentor. I need to let her shine. Just please say hi to us. I don't know if she can hear me, yeah. Yes, I can hear you. I'm trying to see how I can turn on my camera. <laughs> okay, I don't know if you can see me. Yes, we can. 
it's good to see you. All right. Um, so good evening, um, young people and uh, mentors and the speakers of the day. Um, for me, I was just listening in. I met Miriam about two years ago, and um, I'm really glad that she's doing very well. Um, I am a big fan of hers, and I've, I was just listening in the background because uh, I, I'm, I, I feel happy when I see young people doing well, and um, it will be a joy for me to participate in more of your discussions. And uh, even when we're even if I'm quiet in the background, it's also to listen to you. The young people need to be heard. Everybody else has been speaking and speaking and speaking and the young people are not heard. So this is their, this is a youth's time to be heard. And uh, some of us who have just crossed over from the youth bracket are listening and taking in what uh, we can from the young people. So this is a very good initiative. Congratulations, Miriam and your team. And um, count on me for any support that you will need. Thank you. Asante, we will be inviting you very soon. <laughs> I hope you're ready. I wasn't supposed to tell sure. you this early. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> but we'll be inviting you very soon. Um, Walter, again, thank you. Um, Brian, Beryl, Shamine, Leah, and everyone else who was able to tune in today. Um, this marks the end of our two-day virtual town hall. Um, just touching on education and everything that revolves around it. It is not conclusive. Again, we are just starting the conversation. Um, we hope you guys will be able to continue it with your friends and other organizations. And um, there are so many issues that have risen from you know, our two-day discussion. And what from now, what we do from now is that we tell you to look out for our social media platforms. Uh, we promise to do a simplified policy guide to you know, just uh, offer an alternative to the problems that are already you know, occurring in our education sector, and we will do that. Um, allow me to end it at that. It has been enjoyable. It has been very interactive. It has been eye-opening. It has been amazing hearing different perspectives from different people. Thank you, Shamaine. I see you. Great town hall, Asante Sana. We'll be having more of this. We have such town halls every other um, every other month, but you're planning to do more. So we might be having two or three in a month. Just look out for that again. I appreciate your time. Um, I was, for those who do not know me, my name is Miriam Beatrice. I am the current chairperson Youth in Policy. Youth in Policy is an upcoming community-based organization that seeks to have such conversations, such rele relevant conversations with young people, um, you know, to just let our voices be had, as Angela is saying, we've been in the background for way too long and we do not want to, uh, you know, just shut up and wait for people to make decisions for us. So that's what we do. Uh, we cover youth in education, um, climate change, terrorism, um, political participation, and look out for that. We'll be having talks on that as well. And um, yes, it has been an honor and a pleasure moderating this session. I would like to officially call this session to an end. Thank you so much for tuning in. Asante sana. Feel bad again, if you'd end the session for us. <laughs> I think everyone knows your name by now.